Hello and welcome to CSO Connected. Today we have the pleasure of meeting Paul Brooks. He and I are gonna spend some time talking about the buyer-seller relationship. Um, how has it changed? What's happening today? There's rumors that the buyer has all the power because they have access to information. Does that leave the seller as not bringing anything to the table or does the seller still have control and opportunities to guide buyers to make a purchase from them. We're going to unpack that and explore those topics a little bit. Paul, you are the sales director for retail and consumer with Wynn Canton. That's did correct. I get that right? You did. You did. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your role in your business? Sure. Yeah. Well, Wynn Canton is the largest um, logistics company, British logistics company in the UK, uh, the third largest uh, business and fleet in the UK market. Wow. So, um, so we run a lot of um, trucks, clearly, <laughs> uh, run over 200 warehouses and um, deliver pretty much everything. We're sitting here just before Christmas. And so everything that you will consume uh, around Christmas from every grocery retailer in the UK will have probably delivered in some way shape or form so i'm going to confess i will consume too much this yeah. holiday <laughs> season <laughs> yeah. so beers wines and spirits we do extensive amounts of i have a big bonded business and obviously with brexit on the very much on the agenda it's something that we are extremely proud of and very competent in uh, as a business and um, what it means is that uh, we get access to talk to pretty much anybody we like um, in our market people want to talk to us because our expertise but that doesn't necessarily mean they want to do business with us Right. Well, then that, that's both a positive and a negative, I suppose. So you're well regarded for the thought leadership in the space, but always nice when someone likes to affirm that with a, a business deal. Right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, we all like friends, but yeah. it, in business, we need uh, contracts. Well, listen, you ha clearly have extensive experience with buyer-seller relationships and the ways that that has shifted over the landscape of time. And I know that you feel pretty passionate about building relationships and trusts, um, which we'll get onto in a minute. But Tell us a bit about your journey, how, you know, kind of what's brought you to the convictions and the passions you have about sales today, besides lots of experience doing it. Sure, do. Um, well, I started out actually as a buyer. So um, I started out and did all my professional qualifications uh, on behalf of Boots. So I was a retail buyer. I like to say I started out in ladies swimwear, actually, <laughs> um, which is kind of probably the wrong image, but uh, started off uh, buying fashion uh, clothing. Uh, then I moved, uh, got promoted into Garden Chemicals, which wasn't a great change. Um, and then after a time, I left uh, Boots and went into um, uh, to Unipart, uh, so car parts, automotive, because mm -hmm. they wanted to move into retail. And what I found was that actually my journey there was much more around uh, forecasting and development of solutions internal to the business more than okay. retail. And uh, then I left and went into computers and I got to the start of uh, the Internet Revolution, really. Uh, which was a real privilege. And so I was selling the vision of what the internet might become in 1994. And uh, that got me into selling ideas. And that changed me from solutions, uh, creating on supply chain into uh, selling a vision. And that created this sort of ignited my passion for uh, selling solutions around something that was yet to be created, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. The art of the possible. Indeed, you know, and um, so that gave me a passion to sort of create a, a way of talking to people and building relationships about this future vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time doing that. We were extremely successful um, and we floated the company at that time. And um, I then got the opportunity to go back into supply chain um, around um, back to Unipart, because I'd left Unipart at that point, mm -hmm. come away, and um, really set up a business that was all about um, creating a new way of uh, um, adding demand to supply and um, making it really efficient and lean. So we were into okay. lean and continuous improvement and through the Unipart way, well recognized Denning, right? for that. Indeed, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And we launched uh, Dan Jones's book, The Machine That Changed the World in 1990 there. Nice. So that starts to date me, obviously. Um, and then, but what we created was a thing about shared destiny partnership. And that really ignited my sort of, what's my core being? You know, it's actually saying, well, we're gonna create something that is gonna be extremely valued, valuable to both of us over a long period of time. And that really was all about the seller's journey then. So how do we actually create something that we both, you know, it's going to change over time. Yep. It's going to be a lifetime partnership, might start with a five-year contract. Um, but we're going to start thinking on both sides, how we add more value to keep this thing maintained and going. And it's always got to be win-win. So my sort of seller's journey went down that route. And I then started running multiple teams at Unipart worldwide looking at how in different cultures 
we could actually create a selling journey for both startup businesses and long-term businesses um, jointly. That must have been fascinating because not only did you have the cultural realities of operating in different markets, but um, the entire view on business itself. I mean, in some yes. environments, businesses are more held by governments or controlled by governments. Yep. In others, they operate in more free market societies, which uh, certainly goes part and parcel with the culture, but also just the way in which the business approaches its customers. I yes. imagine that must be quite quite different. Yeah, and uh, you know, in some markets, you don't <laughs> market openly. Yeah. You know, you build through relationships and word of mouth. Uh, we set up a business in China, which was incredibly difficult in the early days, getting to understand the culture there. Mm. And I'd had a team come over from Australia to set up China. And actually, it was like oil and water. <laughs> you know, I mean, they just didn't fit together. But we built a way of working uh, with our partners in China. And we learnt and we adapted and we started selling um, much more, more successfully as a consequence once we understood actually um, what they meant when they said yes, or right. what they meant when they said no. And I think, you know, the um, that was quite a challenge. I think you're absolutely right. The cultural shift is quite a challenge. So if I was in uh, Canada and North America, well, it was pretty much the same. It was a bit like Kiwi in Australia. It was always a... Canadians don't like to yeah, hear that. <laughs> exactly. It, ne ne the, the, never the twain shall meet, but actually in terms of the way of selling, yeah. You know, and how we More engaged. More direct, straightforward. Yeah, exactly. You know, it yeah. was the same. Whereas India, everybody kept saying yes, and they were always meaning no. Mm. So that was really hard. And so yeah. big change. I, I've certainly experienced that as well. Um, I've lived in Holland and the UK, and obviously I'm from the States, and have done business across various markets the way that you have. And it, you do find that. Um, I mean, I even find that the difference between British and American many times is quite yes. difficult. I've yes. left meetings and I'll confess, I thought the meeting was fine. I yes. thought it was yes. good. Yes. And a British colleague will say, oh, that was really rough. And I thought, <laughs> well, I've really missed something, yeah. haven't yeah. I? Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. some of the social cues or the use yes. of language, yes. um, you really have to begin yeah. to pick up yeah. on. And I imagine then when you take that out, you know, between the buyer and the seller, so yeah. not just internal, but when you're crossing that divide, if you will, yes. that must become quite complicated. So what have you found is the common thread, though? I mean, no matter which market you're working in and what the culture is, what's the thing that allows that buyer-seller relationship to work well? Yeah, I, I think the, the most important thing is back to where I was before in terms of the destination. So what is it that the sh where you can share that destination? So the buyer is communicating they want to achieve something. Mm -hmm. So it might be service enhancement, product um, essence, relationship, or a cost reduction. So they, they want to achieve something. And the seller's job is to create a unique solution that fits or maybe exceeds the needs that that um, buyer is stating. And I mean, I've always been um, a great Miller-Hyman um, advocate for 25 years. And so, you know, what, what, what's the implied or you know, explicit needs as part of this? Yeah. And who's the economic buyer? Who's the decision maker? So is it the communicator or is it somebody else? So I think the, the seller's journey is the same. So we're looking to say, what's the end value we're trying to mm -hmm. create? And can we create something unique to that? Um, who are we trying to influence? What's the buying group? And over the last um, five years, I think Gartner is saying that the um, the buying group, the decision making unit, has increased from 5.4 to 10.8 over in, only in the last yeah. five years. So actually, so that's what's evolved with time. Who's involved in making the decision? I yeah. think has been the biggest change that I've seen in my 10, 15 years of sales leadership. And actually, we have to our structured selling therefore and who we're creating relationships has become much more complex during that time. And building trust with a decision-making unit rather than an individual is the thing that I'm really trying to unpack at this moment in time to say, okay, can you be unique in doing that? Mm. Or do you have to be you know, scientific in your prosecution of individuals, yeah. like, which we used to be you know, 20 years ago when we d did deals across the table and shook hands with people, yeah. and that meant the deal was done. Yeah, well, I think those days are are long definitely gone. long gone. Long gone. Um, and, and I'd suggest that I think one of the reasons we see such a significant increase in stakeholders is um, things like software as a service, right? Where you're not just selling a particular product that touches one department or a group of people, but you're selling things that are highly integrated that cross departments that feed into various operational systems for a multitude of organizations. And so everyone wants to lay their opinion or their mm. stamp of approval, mm. um, which obviously lengthens the sales cycle and other things, but it most importantly changes who those stakeholders are. And I think deciphering the tea leaves of who really holds the power among that group. So they may need to all be involved, but 
who yes. really um, is controlling the decision is harder, I think, to get to. But um, obviously, this, a lot of this comes down to relationships. Yeah. And I know that's something that you feel a bit passionately about. Um, I understand you're writing a book kind of exploring. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about about the book, but also sort of the philosophy of what you believe relationships are in the selling process? Yes, definitely. I mean, the the foundation and where, where my starting point was, was saying there is a platform that you've got to meet. So it might be a, a qualifier. And I call it the trust platform in the book. So there are elements of the trust platform. And what we're trying to do is to say, okay, when you're on top of the platform, you have built these level of trust. And the trust is with the individual, that ent the entry point to mm -hmm. an organization, which is somebody who's attracted to your product or service. And you have convinced them that that will make a difference to them. Um, but then you're into the sort of decision-making unit. So how do you build trust in a decision-making unit when actually typically only half of them you can physically get to? Mm. So how do you extend your product or service into this? Um, it will make a difference or it could fit within the organization. And I think the technical um, side of software selling or integration of your product or service, an area we work extensively in, mm -hmm. um, I think is the biggest challenge. So you've got to understand that. Um, we might say that in 10 years' time, it won't be a challenge at all because everything will be easily integra integratable, if that's a word. So actually- <laughs> There goes all the consulting money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, the, that's the, the platform is what's the technology, uh, what's the pe who are the people and what are you trying to achieve? And then it's about, do they believe that you will deliver? So this for me now is the selling process. So in the buyer-seller relationship, the buyer then becomes the organization because they have to be absolutely convinced that what you are putting on the table, they will trust to deliver. So they pass the baton, they pass the trust to you. Mm. And at that point, you actually then have to say, okay, can I guarantee it? Ideal. Or do, am I certain that I will deliver it? And can I guarantee the outcome? Perfect. Yeah. So in a trusted relationship, you are certain of the outcome. And that is what the sort of the journey of the book is looking like to say, actually, I start off with a buyer and seller, then I look at a an organization to organization, and ultimately I have a long-term trusted relationship, which is sustainable and it can be delivered and evolved with over time. Mm. And actually, what I look at though, is what's the seller's responsibility in that journey? So we, we talk about a seller being an individual mm -hmm. and professional sales, and how do you professionalize the sales experience? as part of that and can you equip people on that journey? Or is it actually organization to organization? So are you an introductory and a facilitator as part of the journey? Or actually, do you literally have to sell? Yeah. So, and what we're looking at really is that or, an organization buys, individuals recommend, but an organization buys, hence why we've got this big expansion of decision-making teams and influencing groups and yeah. economic buyers. But ultimately, the win is when actually organizational to organizational, the culture fits, the outcome is certain, and then you actually build a joint team that actually evolves the um, the partnership or the journey yeah. around that product or service. So I don't think trust can ever be something taken out of the equation, mm -hmm. right? And, and trust is built through relationships. But there are some interesting things happening in business that could uh, that, that I suppose could turn that on its head. One is um, more than ever, businesses are taking risks going with unknown, untrusted organizations mm -hmm. because it's up and coming and sort of corporate culture has arrived at a place where taking risks is finally rewarded. Yes. Whereas for a long time it was, nobody got fired for hiring the IBMs or it did. It did. Um, in the States where we yeah. said AT&T, right? They, yeah. they, they were trusted yeah. long-term yeah. brands. And so no one veered from those main contracts. But now we're in a day and age where someone can rock up and they have you know, a handwritten business card, but the latest in technology, and yeah. and people will extend their business to them without that trust. Why do you think that is? And is that something that would continue to grow? Is trust and how it's built changing? Or is it yeah. um, that's just a bit of an interesting opportunity at this moment in yeah. time? No, I think it's a really fascinating observation and question. So, I mean, I, I challenge myself with Uber Freight, I call it. <laughs> so, you know, we're a very large logistics business. Ultimately, you can't print on de demand bananas. Somebody's got to physically grow them, pick them, ship them, move them, and get them to store to sell them, that sort of thing. And um, so the physical nature of what we do still exists. Mm -hmm. um, so, and people actually respond to that and re require that. However, the actual coordination and the visibility and the speed 
is the technical or tech solution. And somebody could come in like Uber and say, I can do this in a new way. Um, I think it would be unusual if a Tesco's bought you know, the, the business card and the, the, the jeans uh, view and the tech, uh, but they're looking for it. Mm. That's the thing, they're excited by it. And innovation now is the, it's a sort of buzzword that yeah. actually is true. You know, it's, uh, people are looking for their next best idea. It is happening very quickly. Um, end-to-end -end visibility is really important. So you've got to have all of those elements and you've got to be investing in the people, in the processes for the next generation, the next moment, the next step. So at Wincanton, we actually have 13 tech investments that we've done through a Dragon's Den hmm. environment where we take an equity stake, we give them investment, um, and then we work with them for a year to create a business plan to take to the UK market. Right, which is great because then it gives you at least an opportunity to not only be the the long-standing or the trusted partner, but also yeah. sort of the agile, innovative, yeah. just came up on the market. And by the way, we have all of this experience behind yes. us, which is uh, fantastic. So we sort of learned from the P&G model where actually, you know, you can't do it all yourself. Yeah. Let's buy in the expertise and work with partners. Find, be the best person to collaborate with on a new idea. Yeah, so competition. That's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's competition. Also part yeah, of well, yeah, yeah. It? I mean, we, you know, we're the largest buyer of um, subcontract services in the UK market. So, you know, actually everybody who works in this tiered market of supply chain in the UK works with Wincanton in some way. Okay. And we work with all our competitors as well. You've got your hands in all the pockets. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the right, it's entirely the right phrase, but yes, yeah. we've got our hands in a lot of pies. <laughs> a lot yeah. of pies, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so in the buyer-seller relationship, we've talked about the fact that we now have more people involved. We talked about why we have them involved, or, you know, the way that solutions have become more complex and they cross more operational boundaries. So naturally people need to be engaged. Um, but what, where is the power sitting today? You know, it used to be, it, it was largely in the hands yeah. of the seller. You know, we would bring to bear um, the right information, the solutions, the pricing, the resources. You know, we would wow you, we'd take you to dinner. I mean, we would just overwhelm you yeah, with ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And um, you'd be convinced or dragged right into doing business with us. But yes. somehow the, the seller was really at the heart of that. And, yes. um, you know, whether it was on the, on the golf course or mm -hmm. around the dinner table. Today, because of the internet, buyers have a lot of information. The statistic is out there, it ranges. Is it 60, is it 70, is it 74 percent? But what we know is by the time an RFP crosses our desk, um, that buyer has largely determined what they're already going to do. And so we have to make very good decisions about whether yeah. we participate. So does it mean that the buyer now really holds the power in, mm. the, in the purchasing relationship or does the seller still have a significant role to play? And if they yeah. do, or, or how has it just changed? Yeah, and I think, it, you know, the. The question, well, you made a statement about power. It's not necessarily a statement I would use, but yeah. I absolutely understand where you're coming from. So I, I relate it back. It changed um, the financial crisis, 2008, mm -hmm. nine, changed the way people bought because it changed corporate governance. So, you know, when you're a very large, so we do a hundred million pound deal, say, you know, five mm -hmm. years, 20 million a year. That's a typical sort of deal we would do. So that goes through a lot of governance. Mm. So uh, my answer will be shaped by that sort of corporate governance okay. because otherwise we might get into lots of different buyer seller sure. relationships. So um, the power certainly, um, people went to move, to move to a cost agenda. Yeah. So how can I, can I deliver cost now, or which was really important to them, or can I deliver cost certainty over a future span? Yeah. And so we like had the to, future buying of fuel, which uh, Southwest yeah, intelligently yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. So those, you know, so all those <clears> sorts <throat> of things. So commodities, difficult market yeah. to predict, certainly because of the political environment. But if you look at the sort of supply chains in which we work, um, the buyers uh, didn't have the expertise in joining all of it together. Okay. Okay. So our task as sellers was to actually look at elements of the solution we could add to to make it more attractive. So that was the power shift, if we use right. that, that phrase, because um, I always used to fall out with a lot of people who wanted to buy just small components and packages mm -hmm. and say the best thing for us, Mr. says the buyer, is to package it in and commoditize right. the sellers, take the seller out of the process, because I can actually benchmark it because of the information availability. I can process it automatically, so a low cost of doing business, a low cost of procurement, and I just take all this sort of seller influence mm -hmm. out of the process. Yeah. And so our task was to say, hold on, 
Let me demonstrate to you why that's the lowest value way of doing business. And I think it changed the relationship to say, I need to understand how I add more value to my selling process. Yeah, I need to think more widely about how I can add more value to an organization. So I think the power shift is always, the buyer has to say yes. So ultimately, they have the last word. Mm -hmm. But they can be convinced by this bigger buying unit to say, actually, I can add a lot more value around the sides of this central deal. Yeah. And it made us look much more broadly about what value we could add, at, you know, not just then, but in the future as part of the process. We had to guarantee that the value could be yeah. added and built and all those sort of things. So I think the shift was to the buyer and then it came back to the seller because actually the opportunity was bigger. So I think it's an interesting way to look at it because... Um, I mean, ultimately, power isn't really the best word, mm. but it is this thing of who gets to kind of push and pull and, yes. and how is that happening? And it yeah. has certainly traded hands over time. I think what you described to me does sound similar to consultative selling, yes. right, and the shift towards that, or you know, now what everyone likes to talk about, sort of challenger selling, right, yes. which is yes. perhaps... Um, I think it's it's where the discussion in the sales process has happened. Perhaps that's mm -hmm. moved. Yes. Where before it was more in a transactional space and yep. it probably was sort of features, benefits, pricing, units. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's more around, well, there's a table stakes that says, of course, what you're selling is going to do what I need. Of course, it's going to have these things. It's going to be market competitive enough. And, you know, I'm not going to be willing to pay uh, a, a surplus to get what I think someone else can offer. Yep. But now what's that thought leadership that you bring? What's the expertise that's going to mean that I'm going to be able to do it faster and more efficiently, perhaps at a slightly lower cost and achieve a greater outcome yes. than if I engaged with someone else? And, yeah. and would you agree that that's perhaps where it's shifted to? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I think you mentioned it a few minutes ago about the sort of technical you know, technology is making a big difference. Mm. And so in our sectors, we've got advances in robotics and automation. We're struggling to get people. So we're replacing people with ideas and tech. And actually, you need to understand how all of that fits together. Mm -hmm. And staying abreast of all of that is really crucial now as a seller, because actually that's the thing really the buyer wants to buy. You know, they want to buy future certainty as well as today's price. And you have to link the two together. And that is why I think the shift is actually much more equal. So we yeah. are actually finding, you know, new ideas and new innovation, but it has to be technology te technically acceptable to the organisation in order to do that. Um, and it is right to challenge, you know, it is right to put new ideas and people are looking for that. So that that's the innovation that uh, most organisations are looking for. It is moving too fast for one in organisation, the world this is, it, to say, I want that now and that's going to be sustainable. They absolutely know it's not going to be sustainable yeah. for a long term. So they want flexibility as well as cost. They want innovation and ideas as well as certainty. And I think as professionals... <laughs> they want their cake and eat it too. <laughs> always. That has never changed, has it? That's never changed. So I think uh, what we're trying to do, this sort of uh, challenger, consultative selling, we call it move to the left, so start earlier. Yeah. Because our challenge now in a sort of professional sales capacity is recognising 60% of this decision has been made. How do you unpick that? Because mm. our, our chance to create something unique is to start early. So yeah. we've now, we're now getting much more engaged at an early stage. So our cost of sale is going up. Mm. So the qualification and targeting is now the most important thing that we do, not necessarily the response to a sales process, yeah. which the buyer is trying to initiate or drive. Yeah. So we're trying to get ahead of that to create something that's more visionary, more exciting uh, as part of the journey. And I don't think any um, um, buying director, trading director is trying to take that out of the environment because, as you said, they're looking for the next idea. Yeah. You know, they're actively sourcing now for ideas. And so we are presenting ideas earlier in the cycle to try and influence a better outcome. Yeah. Now, that's reverting back to maybe the golf course days or something like that, which have completely gone. You know, yeah. so this is not a world. So it's, re <laughs> it's research led. It's ideas led. It's innovation led. And you've got to be a leader in those fields. And back to where we've, we started, they've got to trust your view. Mm. They've got to trust your opinion in order to change theirs. And I think they're also looking and, and curious if you found this. I know in my dealings, I find that companies are also looking for where 
um, we might be brave enough to share the risk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, that that's not something that anyone would have really thought yeah, about right before. Sure. Yes. Um, but now it's, well, what kind of risk are you willing yeah. to share with me yeah. if I'm willing to go on this journey with you? How close yeah. of a partnership can we actually craft? And if you're willing to do that, then I'm also happy to share with you in the rewards. Do you, yes. do you see this as well? Oh, I think absolutely that is yeah. the shift yeah. that we're seeing. So um, in our markets, we've got big infrastructure and a lot of assets. Okay, so we build warehouses. You know, half a million square feet is a, a typical large warehouse we mm. would build. And um, if you think of the retail shift that's occurring, so we used to send lots of stuff out of town. Then we had this e-commerce drive, all of a sudden <laughs> online was here. So anything we built previously didn't work. So we built all this e-commerce stuff, okay? Then the out of town died, not quite, but it's dying. Convenience sat in the middle. So I want something convenient. I want it at the same price, by the way. And I want absolute choice. Less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want absolute choice. So all of a sudden the infrastructure didn't work. So the technology and our investments has enabled us to say, okay, we'll use this infrastructure like it was your own but it's somebody else's. So we're trying to act as though all the capacity exists on the roads and in the warehouses yeah. and say, look, we can use it all, but only technology and visibility unpacks that. So and actually everybody recognizes that and you can say, all right, you don't have to pay for that now. You just have to give people the return on it. Mm. So that has changed the entire dynamic. And I don't think we've, we're done with change yet in that dynamic. So I look at the Royal Mail a great example of a, a great business which is struggling to find its niche in this new world of people don't send letters anymore. Yep. So I, I see these fantastic vehicles running. It says, I deliver a billion items. I'm looking at the vehicles thinking, I bet you're only li delivering 800 million now. So, you know, that, you've got lots of capacity. <laughs> the ambition's out there. <laughs> it, indeed, indeed. So I think everybody's changing and there's lots of things we use. We've got to tap into it and it's the ideas the, the far-sighted sort of vision of to say, how can I unlock value and give it back to a customer? Yeah. And it's this unlocking value. And it, I think the great thing is we're no longer talking about price. We, we always talk about price. Yeah. We're now talking about value. Well, and, I, and the words you used earlier was about destiny or destination yes. that you're going to. And um, I always like to talk about outcomes, achieving outcomes, and yeah. that when you achieve outcomes, you create a story. And it's actually the story that ultimately anyone's uh, concerned with. So yes. whether you take a medical device company that um, puts chips into ambulances so that when the patient yeah. arrives at the hospital, they already know what the medical condition is, right? We could sit here and say I sell SIMS yeah. or we could talk about I sell defibrillators, but yeah. actually what I sell is another Christmas with dad. Yes, And yes. that's what people want to know yeah. because yeah. at the end of the day, everything that we do can ultimately change a life in yes. some way. Now, certainly not always to that sort of yeah. grand magnitude, but yeah. Um, they are all sorts of pizza, mm. pieces and parcels mm. of greater stories. Mm. And I think when, we, when we're when able to talk about those stories yes. and those outcomes, yeah. people want to have a conversation yes. with us. If we want to talk about technology, it's sort of, well, everybody's got technology, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think for Wink Hanton's perspective, we're the market leader in health and safety. So we don't hurt people. Great thing to say. Yeah. You know, and everybody benchmarks it. So every day resets itself. 20,000 people going out there, delivering stuff, picking stuff on behalf of the UK market. We want to send them all home safe. Yeah, so that's, a, that's so, fantastic. Look, okay. So what we're saying now is, say, okay, we want to be the market leader in environmental logistics. So actually, wow. we want to protect the future as well. Yeah. So actually, people look at us and say, um, well, you're running dirty lorries. Well, actually, we've got the cleanest fleet in the UK. So, but we're still emission, you know, we still use diesel. So we've got a fleet of electric vehicles because urban logistics will be fully electric probably within 10 years, might be faster. Yeah. So we've got to move with where the country wants us to move to, where the world wants us to move. And we've got to take a leadership position. So I think selling now, going back to the sort of the whole relationship is, if you've got a leadership position, you know, you've got to live by the values that sit with it. I mean, I'm really interested in the, the world of Generation Z, my kids, you know, where are they coming from? What are they going to? And um, what's their world of work? And so they, they have a, 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 a conscience mm. that is far removed from when I was 22. You know, so they are saying, look, do these things first. I am prepared to pay more. I want convenience because I've been brought up on that. I want information because I see it every minute of every day. However, I want to buy into the values of what you're selling. Well, I think they've definitely recognized the power of the consumer. Yes. Um, which is remarkable since most of us adults don't seem to necessarily <laughs> embrace it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think we're coming close to our time, but one thing we haven't had an opportunity perhaps to hear your expertise and, and your passion about is this sort of professionalizing mm. of sales. We have touched on it a bit. Mm. Um, I know it's a topic that I speak about with colleagues in terms of almost legitimizing the profession yes. in a more academic sense yes. as well. Yes. And what are your thoughts around the professionalizing yeah. of sales? Yeah, I mean, I mean definitely from, from me, it's a real passion, I think, in terms of learning. Can, can you teach something? I think that's the, the key thing. So. We, we always start with a raw material that sort of fits what sales is about. You know, you want energy and dynamism. Uh, we've talked about it. it it's very research driven now. Uh, it's very um, art being able to articulate this vision or the steps towards it. So the communication skills, the presentation skills are still very much there. So professionalizing the way we communicate and what we say and how we say it, I think is a core of our very being. And so I'd like to make sure that we're always on that. But I think this consultative selling the challenge uh, to customers in, in a way that actually inspires customers to buy from you is the thing that I'm most passionate about. So can we get um, sort of courses, material, online, whatever, and there's lots there and lots of good organisations mm. uh, that says, OK, well, look, as you go through sales, you, know, you learn stuff. OK, okay now, now sharpen it in a way that makes you more successful. Now learn skills that allows you to coach other people, manage other people in that area. So it's a, a step. Then you're managing, okay, now I want mentoring. So I can guide and shape organizations first, but then my own organization and my own team. So I move into leadership. And the, for me, the destination is always leadership. Mm. So from sales professionalism, the components, sales management, the coaching, to sales leadership, the direction, I think everybody should have a set pattern and a set journey that follows that through. Do you think that we would benefit from some type of certification as other uh, professional bodies have or something of that sort to help legitimize that that journey is something more academic than just uh, you sold the most over and over so we just kept promoting you? Yes. Because yeah. I think there's certainly a perception of that, isn't there? Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, look, I mean, we are a results game. Yeah. So let's, let's just you know, strip everything away I buy my striker to score goals. So if you're the best seller, you're going to get employed. Actually, as an industry and as a body, we want professionalism because we want to be respected for what we do. And I think you know, an acknowledgement that a chartered standard or something like that yeah. exists for sales, I think is an essential component of tomorrow's world. And I think it's building from today. And we see the Association of Sales Professionals and others trying to move in that direction. So I think that's a good thing. Mm. Um, I was president of the world's largest institute in logistics. And you know, we are the leading chartered profession in logistics. And I think everybody respects it because of the qualifications, yeah. the academic qualifications that we bring. But let's just recognize that Good professionalism should be recognised as well. Mm. And you can learn without academic qualifications and you can perform at the same level. And so that experience alongside qualifications and continuing development, because it's research and scientific and, you know, process driven and knowledge acquired. We have to make sure we can actually compare the two and say, yes, this is a qualified or certified professional. Yeah. And I think it's absolutely essential that we head in that direction. Otherwise, you know, others will take our role. Yeah. Us. Well, there's a whole different discussion, isn't there, around artificial intelligence and the yes. role of the salesperson, but that's yeah. for a, a conversation time. for another day. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you had a few last pearls of wisdom to lead, leave our audience with around sort of the buyer-seller relationship and what, what to be mindful of as they move forward into the next few years with the pace of change and the economy yeah. and all the <laughs> fun joys that we, uh, that yeah, we get to wisdom. have. Pearls yeah, of wisdom. Yeah, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> pearls so, of wisdom. So, so I think it's, it's definitely around... Um, Understand how you build trust. Understand how you're going to add value in that environment. Um, you've got to add some value by bringing knowledge first and bringing expertise to any relationship. People will trust you because of your expertise. You have to operate with integrity, and we take that yeah. without saying. But I, I think, you know, look at the destination. Where are you trying to end up with this relationship? What's the first step, and what are continuing steps? And actually, build a plan that will deliver those and never forget that and stick with it. Be flexible, bring new ideas, but keep to your plan would be my pearl of wisdom, I think. Perfect. Thanks so much for your time today. I've learned a tremendous amount and really appreciate and enjoyed your passion for the topic. So Pleasure. Thank thanks you very again. much. Thanks Cheers. for